This episode is brought to you in part by Viva Systems. Look, there are a lot of e-reg systems coming to market. Uh, some are great, some are terrible. My favorite, by far, is Viva Site Vault. Uh, Site Vault makes it incredibly easy for research sites to have one place to work with sponsors. Helps you reduce the number of systems and logins that you use to run your clinical trials. Look, there's already almost 5,000 sites using Site Vault. There are 400 industry sponsors that are also using Viva clinical applications in the background. Uh, at this point, there are 65% of global clinical trials running on Viva. That is a lot of sites, sponsors, and trials. The best part is, if you're a site, Site Vault is completely free to use. To learn more, check it out at sites.viva.com today. This episode is also brought to you in part by Real-Time CTMS, a leading provider of innovative software solutions for clinical trial research sites, site networks, sponsors, and CROs. Real-Time systems allow users to manage complex clinical research processes with powerful user-friendly interfaces that are revolutionizing how research gets done. To get a free demo, check out the company's website at realtime-ctms.com and complete one of their contact forms. Hello and welcome to the Note to File podcast, a collection of interviews, best practices, and candid commentary for clinical research sites. I'm your host, Brad Hightower. Uh, our guest this week is Mike Winger. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mike. Uh, if you did not see his live stream, make sure you check out notetofilepodcast.com and uh, check out the live stream that we did in which he uh, goes through Versa Trial and gives a little uh, kind of on-the-spot demo. I think it's super awesome, some great insight uh, into the system they're building over at Versa Trial. Uh, but Mike is a software developer. He's been building solutions for clinical research for over 15 years. Uh, he worked at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, connecting Parkinson's patients to clinical studies. Uh, he built Sightline Connect to connect patient recruitment companies in pharma. Uh, he's now the founder and CEO of VersaTrial, a platform that reimagines the clinical trial site workflow. Uh, this week, we discuss the chaos that clinical trial sites often have to deal with, how this chaos ultimately impacts research participants, and how sites can stay better organized with a simple browser extension. Uh, without further ado, Mike Winger. All right, Mike, man, glad to have you back. We just came off of a uh, LinkedIn Live recently, and I uh, appreciate you coming on and do a full podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me, Brad. Absolutely. I'm going to treat you just like every other guest, man. I want to hear a little bit about your, uh, your sort of research origin story. Uh, I think, again, I think it's always fun, uh, interesting to hear how people kind of got into the industry and... Uh, it's always also interesting, I think, to hear the sort of breadth and depth of experience people have uh, can oftentimes really paint the perspective of what people are doing. So if you would uh, indulge us and tell us about your your background. Yeah, happy to. And I know I touched a little bit on this in, in LinkedIn Live, but just to, to revisit it. So in college, kind of a, a key moment for me that sent me down this path. It was my senior year. Uh, it was the winter break. I was having really bad headaches. Uh, went to my doctor who sent me to a neurologist. Neurologist did a scan, got a call later that day. You have to go to your Presbyterian ASAP today. Things kind of got scary, went with my whole family. And later that day was diagnosed with a brain tumor and uh, very surreal experience. Didn't have a lot of information at the time that was actionable. The neurosurgeon at the time walked me through what potential surgeries might look like and the risks involved and basically said that based on location, surgery is not a great thing. Uh, so we want to try to avoid it at all costs. And we don't know how fast the tumor is growing. So all a lot at once. I think I went home, had a day or two at home just to try to figure out what to do next and end up just going back to college that, that following day. And it wasn't until several months later that we realized that the tumor was very slow growing. The headaches actually weren't related to the tumor, but were more stress induced and just kind of lifestyle changes. And it was really interesting. This ended up taking me down a, a very quantified self type of path, but I started a, a headache diary, tracking my headaches every day. And you quickly kind of realize that whether it was dehydration or bad sleep or an upcoming exam, like all of it was like that event and then the headache. And it, it, the correlation was really interesting to see. So it, it definitely, on the other side of that experience, I walked away with a different perspective around what it means to be healthy and what goes through the process of when you feel like you are at risk or, or not healthy. Uh, and I 
came out of it feeling very fortunate that my prognosis meant that this is something that probably won't affect me in my lifetime, but also could recognize that a lot of people in similar situations that I was in have much more difficult prognosis where that surgery is required or this is something that's going to have a, a negative impact on you moving forward. So I think that, that kind of wake up call got me initially down the path. And then it was a few years later, I had an amazing opportunity to join the Michael J. Fox Foundation based out of New York City, right around a time they were building out a digital strategy team. Most patient advocacy groups don't have a lot of resources. And, and it was a really fortunate time or for the foundation where the surrogate brand, the founder of Google, he had um, uh, st- started supporting the foundation. And there was a lot of resources well above and beyond what was just funding science out of the lab. And there was this really interesting inflection point where we could actually build platforms and technologies and make investments to invest in the ecosystem to accelerate research in the Parkinson space. So we started and we worked on a, one of the, the earlier, one of the first solutions that connected uh, Parkinson's patients with clinical studies. Uh, it was Fox Trial Finder was the, the name of the platform. We invested in longitudinal registries of Parkinson's patients, genetic testing, conducted some of our own studies as well. So really interesting time to be at the foundation where we had the resources to invest in technologies and, and do right by patients and help patients. Amazing organization, amazing part of my career, something I'm really proud of. And when I left the Fox Foundation, kind of recognized that there was a lot of other advocacy groups out there that didn't have the same sort of funding and resources. And so started a essentially what was a kind of a volunteer project. It ended up ultimately becoming a a business, but it, it was called Clinical Trial Connect. And it was basically building trial finders for patient advocacy groups as a white labeled solution. And I did that for many years as a side project, nights and weekends thing, and uh, really enjoyed it. Got to work with many amazing organizations over the, that period, got to meet amazing patients that had benefited from the trial finder tool. And I really wanted to work on it full time. That was one of my big goals. I wanted to work on this full time. Advocacy groups don't have great budgets. I was, uh, the cost for each advocacy group was only $600 per year. So not, not enough to, to cover a salary. Uh, But I I wanted to keep working in this space and working on solutions for patients. I had an amazing opportunity to meet Jeff Kozloff, the CEO of Trialscope, uh, and Craig Lipset, former head of clinical innovation at Pfizer. And we all came together with with kind of different perspectives of clinical research. You had um, myself with really interesting tooling to help connect patients to studies and trying to build a, a business model with pharma. You had Craig coming from Pfizer or formerly of Pfizer and saying, there's lots of great startups in the space and I have a really tough time working with, with them and as they kind of try to email me every day. And then you had uh, Jeff, who was the CEO of Trialscope, which was a, a well-established technology company servicing pharma companies. The, the three of us all kind of came together with those different perspectives and said, there's got to be a better way for pharma to work with companies that either are traditional patient recruitment companies or maybe companies that don't view themselves as patient recruitment companies, but have really meaningful reach to patients, such as my company, Clinical Trial Connect, or another company that I worked at had iPads in the waiting room at doctor's offices. We were really interested in connecting patients to research, but we had no connection to all the big pharma and and had no way to build business models there. So the whole idea was, you know, if you look at Airbnbs and other interesting marketplaces in other industries, there's a lot of efficiency gains when when a market comes together, but why hasn't that been done in patient recruitment? And so we set out and and what ultimately became Sightline Connect, uh, we built a two-sided marketplace where a pharma company can say, we need help recruiting specific patients for specific studies. And then we can turn it around and take that to all the companies out there, both incumbents, big and small startups, pharmacies, labs, and just say, if you can help us find these patients and bring this study opportunity to those patients, there's revenue that can be passed to you for creating that value. Really, another great part of my career, I spent three years building that out. Uh, We went through a successful uh, acquisition and and were acquired by Informa about a year and a half ago. And uh, through that experience, got to learn a little bit more about just how pharma companies work in terms of procurements, the how it once you're a preferred vendor and you're on the inside, things get really easy. And when you're on the outside, things are basically impossible. Like it's almost like we love what you're doing, but because you don't have this piece of paper signed, 
the soonest we could get you in is nine months from now. And we'll probably be going through a reorg by then. So yeah, but you know, we're just going to go work with the incumbent. So I, it kind of quickly became clear to me from that perspective, why the status quo is just easy and why it was really hard to be disruptive because as a small bootstrap startup, very few people can survive nine to 18 month procurement cycles and, and get the goodwill of a pharma to be your champion through that whole period. So yeah, so th- that kind of covers a lot of the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, about back in May, realized I was ready for a change and realized I'd worked with pharma, I'd worked with recruitment companies, I'd worked with patients. And the one group that I really, really enjoy spending time with and I really like getting to know is clinical trial sites. I'd been to several site solution summits. Through my previous roles, I had a chance to, to talk to and email and, and go to sites uh, and visit them. And it just felt like, and Brad, you do a great job of, of talking about the experience of a site uh, through your, your different channels, but it, until you're like there in person and you see it, you quickly realize just how difficult it is. Patients are coming in 30 minutes late. Uh, you, it's a normal kind of doctor's office, chaotic. You don't manage your own calendar. And then there's, there's lulls, there's very busy periods. Uh, there's a lot of competing tug of war of your time across studies and other things going on. And all of a sudden you're jumping in and out of different technologies that you've never used before, or you're using for the first time or are buggy and don't work. And you got to maintain scientific rigor. Like that's, that's stressful. Lives are on the line. Outcome of a study is on the line. And, and so you're just so much is thrown at you. And what I really, the reason why I really wanted to start working on Versatrial and build something for sites was because I feel like you guys don't have a, a seat at the table when it comes to a lot of the technology vendors that are out there. Like maybe, you know, there's, there's CTMSs and there's other tools, but a lot of times it's the pharma driving the, the buy decision and, and telling you what to use and wanted to figure out how do you make the lives of that coordinator that's new to the industry that just started all the acronyms they have to learn, all the different technology tools they have to figure out how to use, all while there's you know patients in the waiting room that are coming in happy or frustrated or whatever it may be like that. that it's just a very difficult environment to be in. And it's, especially during the pandemic, I, it's not so surprising to me why there was just so much turnover in the industry because it's just such a hard to do, job to do under normal circumstances. And it gets even harder when you add a, a pandemic on top of it. So that's a long rant for me, but that that's kind of uh, 15, 15 years in a, in a nutshell. Nice. No, it's good. I think it's, uh, to your point, it's not always appreciated how chaotic it is at the site level. Um, to, I mean, it is, it's a lot, not unlike a doctor's office, except it's like a, it's like a doctor's visit plus, right? Because there's all the other stuff that you're doing special for each study. If you're running 10 studies, that adds up pretty quick to create a, a lot of chaos for, for the site. Uh, the coordinator or whoever the particular staff may be. Um, and again, to your point, there's not been a lot of solutions geared towards sites and especially with the input of sites, you know, CTMS is one thing, but it still feels like a pretty or not super mature market yet. Uh, maybe I don't know if that's a fair characterization, but you know, there's not a ton of options and they're still, I think they're still kind of figuring it out. So, uh, I mean, I love that you started to pursue that part of the industry there. So, I mean, what sorts of problems or what does Versatrial set out to, to try to help sites with? What particular issues? Yeah, I, um, when, we, when I first started down this path, I think what was nice about it, I'm a, so I'm a software developer, I'm a product person. You can't just build something and then try to sell the thing. You got you to really find like a core problem that would get someone to act that they need, really need fixing. And maybe they don't even know it. And so it took a lot of time to just sit at a site and just look for patterns and, and pattern recognition is key to, to figure out something that scales and can be built and, and used by everybody. And the, the one pattern that was just so obvious was there's so many portals that a sponsor tells a site they have to use. And there's so many places a site needs to go, even within their own systems, that I think this is a year or two ago, but there's an SCRS study where they surveyed all the, the sites out there. And it was, I think on average, someone's logging into 20 systems per day. So I mean, 20 systems that like, if you just go through the math of, you know, if you're not in our industry, you're maybe opening up your email and you're maybe going into Salesforce and that's it. But 20 systems per day, 
each sponsor, each study bringing their own technologies to the party. So compounding the problem. Uh, and then you'd have to keep track of it in your head. So, okay, this EDC is for that study and this EDC is that. And then the R's of the IRT and this group is using a centralized recruitment campaign. And, oh, we recently migrated CTMSs. So that study is actually more than six months old. So we got to always remember for EREG, we got to go into this other place. And it's just the only way that I think people were getting by was either one of two tools, which are very creative, but they, they weren't solutions. It was more just out of necessity. They would either use the bra- the bookmarks in their browser, and I would watch this pattern again and again, where someone would go and create a folder in their browser bookmark and say, you know, this is study one, two, three with sponsor ABC. Uh, and then let's say the EDC and the IRT and the EREG and whatever it might be. There are other sites out there that would use Excel files and do a similar sort of thing in an Excel file. But the challenge with both of those approaches is you've solved that for yourself, but as a team, you know, clinical research is a team activity. There's the lead coordinator, the backup coordinator, the PI, the site manager, everybody kind of needs that data. So you're either, everyone's reinventing the wheel and having to do those steps themselves. It gets really hard when there's turnover, someone leaves, they had all the context in their head and then a new person is coming in and has to kind of play catch up really fast. So the very first solution was, let's just reimagine how bookmarks work within the context of clinical research and with the added benefit of team collaboration and sharing. So that's what led us to develop the idea of a study organizer. It's not a place to store your documents, It's not a system to enter patient data in. It's really just what it sounds like. It's a bookmark manager tool to just understand for a particular study, where are all the places I might need to go regularly? And how do I turn that from like just trying to remember it from my head? And how do I also turn it from 10 clicks into one click? Uh, And then similarly doing the same approach with contact details. So one of my favorite quotes is someone said, you know, CRAs change more often than my socks. And so you're like, okay, well, where does that CRA's contact details live? And you're like, okay, well, it lives in my outlook. It lives in my head. I think it's in the CTMS. I think, you know, I think it might be over somewhere else. It's, it might be in Salesforce, but how do you keep that front page top of mind so that everybody on the team knows who the current CRA is. And if there's a change, one person changes and everyone gets to you know, benefit from that, that collaboration and collaborative update. So for us, Study Organizer was all about very simple solution to try to come in and, and take what people were already doing and just enhance it a little bit and not really worry about the idea of a heavy-handed change management, extensive training, but try to keep it nice and, and, and minimal. Yeah. And I I mean, I appreciate that about it. It's pretty, I mean, it's simple. It's almost stupid simple, which is what you want, frankly, for a solution like this. And again, I think it's, I don't think people appreciate for things that you even take for granted. Like I do a lot of the regulatory work still for, for some of my sites. And I mean, there are four different central IRBs even that stuff is spread out across. So even something you would think would not be challenging to like keep up with like what irb is it with uh needs to be tracked and looked at and kept up with and then you know to your point a lot of everything still kind of lives in email yeah or on on whiteboards whiteboards and email is the the right yeah no we've we've got yeah we've got a couple whiteboards with a lot of info on them but the issue there is that even then like if i got a backup coordinator or i've got a blinded raider or someone on my study with me on the site level, only I'm getting the emails or only they're getting the emails. And so again, even half the team knows what the hell's going on at any given time. And to your point too, yeah, maybe you can track that, but then you've just created another silo that nobody knows what's going on after a budget or contract is negotiated. Oftentimes that contact is just lost in the wind. You don't know who that is anymore. So if you need to go back and ask, Hey, do we get a travel reimbursement? Do we have travel uh, do we, can we, in, we need to increase our subject stipend? I mean, simple things, but you know, you go back through and well, since then we've done 10 more trials with Pfizer. So I don't even remember which person I'm talking to. Again, it's a, it doesn't seem like it's that complicated or that big of a problem, but especially as you scale and grow as a site and depending on what your infrastructure looks like, it can be extremely complicated just to track simple things like that. And, and every inch is a mile uh, and it adds up to a mile because just that extra two minutes of cognitive load of you being like, oh, like, you know, it was the Pfizer guy, but like, was it a mic or John? like, you know, just, just going back and trying to track that down or what system do I need to go to? 
And in, in a lot of instances, it, it's not just two minutes, it's five, 10, 20 minutes to, to go and find something. And then you find it and it's stale data. Like that's the other thing too. Do you, do you trust all the data in your systems? Once data is, oh, I updated something and now I don't revisit or see it and it's not front page and it's 10 clicks away, it, it's good chance in a month or two that that's not data you can trust anymore. So how do you make sure that the data that is the most important of who at my site is working on the study, uh, where are all the places that they are going, and who are they talking to externally? That needs to be front page for everybody shared, collaborated, and up to date. So if all of a sudden you know I give my paternity leave and I leave tomorrow, someone can come and pick up and not skip a beat. Well, I think also what people don't always realize is that stuff affects patients. I mean, it's it's one thing if I can't find you know CRA to ask a question to in a random time of day, but oftentimes it's that <laughs> the patients here in clinic, I'm need access to a system or a system's not functioning correctly. It happens all the time. Uh, or maybe even it's something simple, but like, which system do I need to be in? Who do I need to talk to? I need to figure that out right now. And instead, you got a patient sitting in the in the waiting room or the exam room for an extra 40 minutes while you're trying to, you know, phone tree or a contact form from the sponsor and then rifling through a list of people who aren't even the right person to talk to. So again, a fairly simple issue, but it really the ramifications are pretty big because pretty soon your patient's like, yeah, cool. I'm not coming back. I sat here for two hours while you tried to figure out how to randomize me. So what are we doing here? Right. Uh, So yeah, the ramifications can be extremely impactful and that's not, (laughs) that's not good. So again, seemingly simple, but can make all the difference in the world. So are you giving me another system to log into? I mean, come on, what are you doing? You're making it worse. No, no, trying to trying to do right do right by sites. So we for to actually log into Versatrial, we leverage your work email credentials. So if you're on Gmail or Outlook, that's how you're going to be able to get access to the system. So not a, another password to worry about. And we're actually just uh, finalizing the launch of a password manager tool that sits and works nicely with the bookmark organizer. So passwords is another thing that we observed as a problem to to take on. So a lot of sites would save passwords in Excel files or in the browser or or maybe introduce a password manager. But all that is a very individualized activity where Mike's password is securely stored in a vault, but the larger organization doesn't know if Mike has access to a system or not. And I think that's that was the missing link that sites were craving, because especially in a world of turnover especially in a world where there's certain critical systems that you always need to have an SOP where there's a backup in place, a password manager doesn't solve that for you. So for the, the Versatrial password solution, what we're actually introducing is still that same, Mike's password's not being shared, it's stored just as securely as if it was in a password manager. But at the organization level, at the site manager level, we know that Mike has access to this EDC system and that IRT system. And we also know that Mike is the only person with access to that system. Mike just gave his notice. We need to find a replacement for Mike. What credentials do we now need to prioritize running down the line to make sure we're setting up his replacement with? Yeah, no, that's that's big because, yeah, we ran into this too. Uh, <laughs> we've ran into this just recently. I'm like, uh, I mean, even, even for me sometimes, it's like, oh, do I have access to that? Or like, yes, I have access to that EDC, but do I have access to that study within that EDC? Right. Uh, okay, no, I don't. Do you? Oh, I don't know. Wait, you should, but do you? I'm not sure if I do or not. Hold on. So yeah, to be able to sort of easily see that so I can say, oh, okay, yeah, I'm not the one who has access, but my coordinator, my coordinate, other coordinator has access to blank, you, you know, the uh, IRT system so they can get drug uh, dispensed, but I can't. So yeah, even that is uh, a pretty strong use. I mean, I love that. I didn't even know you, I didn't know you guys were, were getting, uh, having that feature in there. So nice. Uh, come coming very soon. Uh, the other thing too is like invite links. You got invited to the system. You didn't. You kind of procrastinate it, right. and now the, the the link has expired. And now it, you're, you know your your activation visits coming up to, to tomorrow, and you're scrambling to find that link that's expired to now escalate to try to get a new new link sent out. So very much the the idea of the site organization having better visibility into just system access. Um, I talked with one site where they had a truly critical issue where uh, uh, the, like data lock or something was going on that was very time sensitive. No one could get into the system and it kind of blew up in their face. And they now have an SOP where once a month, every person has to try to log into every system with a 
a partner to verify and make sure that the access is there. And we're looking to here at Versatrial, remove that manual overload and, and try to still give you the same visibility and awareness. Yeah, I bet the coordinators really love that SOP. I'm sure they're big fans yeah, of having yeah. to do that. But, but yeah. I mean, I understand the intent and it's unfortunate we have to do those sorts of things just to cover our asses. But again, if you have a system in place like, like Versatrial where you can tell at a glance, I mean, that, again, that could be make a huge, huge difference. I also know, like for me, I fill out a lot of feasibility questionnaires. There's a few things that are a pain in the ass about doing feasibility questionnaires. You know, one is, you know, for example, I'm filling out the same information over and over again, and even uh, having to track down answers from disparate sources. I'm having to shoot, pull out two questions to send to the physician. I'm having to send two more questions over to a clinic manager or maybe a, a coordinator who's on site at that particular site. So. I know that's something you're uh, also sort of attacking with uh, Versatrial as well. Yeah. When when we started first working on Versatrial, I actually didn't really know what a feasibility questionnaire was. We were doing bookmarks and that was our starting point. And it, it was really interesting to just start to understand the, the time investment of w- trying to win studies. Because we saw people would start to add bookmarks of what the feasibility questionnaire link was. And then that led to more and more conversations. And it became very apparent that for a small site, whether it's the owner or someone else that's kind of just trying to do this off the side of their desk, or it's a larger site network where there's a dedicated BD team of five people that are filling out 30 to 50 questionnaires a week. The problem is the same in both places. If you are that site, you want to know what answers am I giving to this sponsor on this study? So when they come on site, I don't look silly. And I, I can speak to my answers. The other thing then comes up is great. I did a feasibility questionnaire three weeks ago. A lot of the same questions being asked again, how do I best reuse previous answers to save myself time and make sure that those answers are getting better over time. So I'm always putting my best foot forward. And again, what was amazing to see is if you sit at the, the sites, the very creative solutions to solve for that. So a lot of folks would copy and paste their answers out of the survey into like an Excel file or a Word document so that they had an archival reference that could be searched. That works okay, but Excel and Word are not great tools for finding stuff or searching. And then other folks would maybe even grab screenshots before they hit the submit button so that they had at least the original answer in the survey. And that's even worse for searchability because it's a PDF and you can't search it at all. So now you have this problem of, great, I know I answered this question literally two weeks ago, where is that? What document? Can I find it? I can't. Okay, I'm going to start from scratch and just rewrite the answer over again. So that's what we were seeing in the status quo. And it, it's not getting any easier. I was just at a D-Farm conference in Boston two or three weeks ago, and WCG was presenting on what is the average number of questions in a feasibility questionnaire? And uh, it was two years ago, it was 88. So that's average. So there's going to be some less, there's going to be some that's way more. And then as of, the, as of recently, it has gone up from 88 to 92. So it's going in the wrong direction, even though you could all say, we could all say, oh, I'm, this is surprising considering the CROs and the sponsors probably have this data readily available. For sure. But the question, number of questions are going up. Uh, I talked with one woman recently that had just completed a, a 35 page questionnaire. And I said, oh, that's not that bad. Only 35 questions. And she's like, no, Mike, 35 pages of questions took hours. And so the idea of what we wanted to do with a Versatrial solution was recognize there's no way we can get every sponsor to agree on a survey tool. There's no way we can get every sponsor to agree to share their site data. So let's not try to change the sponsor behavior, but let's build something for sites that universally works. No matter how you get a survey sent to your inbox, you would be able to go in and just magically auto record your answers as you type them in. And then if you ever wanted to be able to reference a previous answer, just a one click of an icon slides in all of your your library of previous answers, one click auto populate, sign out to a a teammate and create a workflow for them to complete it. All sits on top of the survey itself without having to go try to find it or go to email and try to follow up with someone to get, get an answer. So we we leverage browser extension technology to really sit on top of the survey tools that are out there today and make it very easy for a site to 
standardize that workflow experience, regardless of how a sponsor is is sending the survey out. Yeah. And again, I love, I mean, I know for me, it's always been a challenge to work with all the different parties to help answer questions and sort of track that in a meaningful way. You know, I was for a time, I was pulling out questions and putting them into a Microsoft form and sending that link to the Microsoft form to the doctor, because I would, if I copied it in an email, he would only answer two of the six questions I needed him to answer. And so it would be incomplete. I have to ask him again. So uh, I mean, I love being able to just link it right up in a way that, you know, I, I can actually tell what the hell's going on, uh, which again is, <laughs> doesn't seem like rocket science, but makes a significant difference in terms of, you know, being able to get things done. So again, I, I appreciate the sort of nuance you've been able to pick up on that. I don't think a lot of people appreciate about what happens at the site level, because again, it's a, uh, you wouldn't know that I don't think unless you had spent some significant amount of time. Uh, out of sight. Yeah, it definitely, you know, sometimes the, like the pain point, you need to see it a couple times before it clicks and it takes, it takes time to, to figure that out. And one of the things that I really like that we were talking about in the, the LinkedIn live earlier or last week was that idea of trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes on the other side of the industry. We all kind of sit in the site role or the CRO role or the pharma role or the tech vendor role or the patient role, lots of different perspectives. And the more we can all gain perspective from the, the, our counterparts, I think we'll all be able to better understand what problems make sense to tackle and how we might be able to tackle them. And, and one of the things that I, I guess just probably hard is if you put yourself in any of those shoes, everybody has their tasks in front of them of what you need to do just to, the, you know, the meeting schedule, the calendar is filled with meetings. I, I, you know, I, I'm a very empathetic person. I want to understand sites and I, I believe in sites and I you know, want to understand patients, but I don't have the time to get out of my worldview to go understand someone else's worldview. So if there's ways as an industry we can figure out, and I know we were talking even before this podcast of, you know, short-term job shadowing or, or a, a way to just see a day in the life of this person, um, hopefully more of those problems start to become visible. And hopefully the folks that are trying to solve problems can now discover that and fix it for somebody. Yeah, I know. I mean, I love that. And, you know, obviously I'm, I work at the site level. I have my whole career, so I'm pretty guilty of, of a fairly narrow perspective. I mean, I do have the benefit. A lot of people don't by just speaking to a lot of people across the industry, but a lot of your regular quote unquote study coordinators uh, who just work in their job, you know, going home, they, they don't, you know, having these conversations at, at this level, I would love, <laughs> I'd love to have some kind of like exchange program, right? Like I'd love to go to a sponsor and spend a day and like see what the management over there has to deal with or how decisions are made. And likewise, I'd love for them to see how, you know, sites have to operate. I know that's not super practical necessarily, but I think people would probably come up with some shocking revelations to have to, you know, step into other people's shoes, right? Yeah. I think what just gets tough about our industry is it's an industry that's just kind of built on like IP and secrecy a little bit. Like you at, at the pharma level, you don't sharing is not the default state. Right. Uh, as a software developer, sharing is the default state. Open source is a thing. I write code. I want to share it with everybody so everyone can benefit from my code. Whereas I think in the in the world of drug developments, like if there's an insight to be gained from a conversation with a site, and you're a pharma person, like you want to kind of lock that down. You want to you want to know that, and you want to use that as a competitive edge to be the preferred sponsor at that site. You're not looking to go broadcast that on a on a LinkedIn live with Brad Hightower. Uh, so, so as a result, you end up with a lot of pharma that I think, I, I don't know how we fix this one, but like they'll, they'll do site advisory boards. They'll do patient advisory boards. I don't know how many pharma are out there, but all of them are, are like trying to get access to people like you or trying to get access to patients, but then not doing it either in a public open source sort of way. And like giving back is a, you know, I, we recorded it and here's all the takeaways and the lessons learned. And then what that means is you now as a site, you work with 20 pharma, if they really are going to try to do right by sites, that's 20 different conversations for you to have rather than a single round table where the 20 pharma are all there talking with a couple of sites in a collaborative way. Right. I, I know like we have things like Transcelerate and other initiatives where that, that we, we try to do right in that pre-competitive space. But I, I think there's way, way, way more conversations that would be really fruitful that just I don't think are possible in today's environment of no, those are my sites. I want to I want to like, you know, talk behind 
closed doors, I don't want to put that out in the public. Yeah, that's fair. And, you know, the other side of that is I think sites have been the same way. I mean, we, even when it's not competitive, I think some sites still don't want to share what they consider to be, you know, their proprietary way of doing things with other sites. And, uh, you know, it's, it's competitive, but not really. I mean, there's a site down the street that I've done business development for. If I don't have a study or a, a doctor that I can work with, I'll hand them a study. Uh, and sometimes we've done the same studies and we've both been successful by, by sharing, you know, information with each other. And, you know, even though we're a couple of miles away, there's enough patients that, uh, you know, we can, we can each attract. So, yeah, I don't love that there's sort of a scarcity mindset at the site level, but also <laughs> we do not have the billions of dollars that a lot of the the sponsors do. So that also, you know, creates its own uh, sort of little boxed in way of thinking sometimes. And, you know, that's all I've wanted to do is sort of bring those conversations more, more publicly. So, but to your point, it does make sense in some ways that I guess sponsors want their own secret insight and then as a result, relationship with, with some of these sites. And I guess I've, I've never really considered that to be a possibility. Yeah. I, I, you, you make the good point. The secrecy is on both sides a little bit. And so then you have this many to many problem for us all to knowledge share. That's, you know, that's not a couple of conversations. That's hundreds and thousands of conversations. And, and no one's got the time for that because we all have our busy calendars to get the stuff that we need to get done. So yeah, I, 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 you know, I think your your podcast bringing people on, getting people sharing perspectives is like a nice way to try to scale that a little bit. But I, I do think sometimes just hearing, you know, if someone's listening to me talk now, you're only hearing like thirty minutes a snapshot of something. It's very different than going and actually spending the day at the site, spending the day at the tech vendor, spending the day at the CRO, because that's when you really kind of put yourself in their shoes and get to understand the fears, the motivations, the the risk, the why is the status quo the default? And we all bang our heads on the wall and say, well, why can't we just, you know, get these two folks to act differently or change in some way? And then you kind of realize there's just, it's hard to start inertia when when the status quo is easier. Yeah. No, I mean, to your point, it's not solved in a day. These are decades of of grinding every day that have created these, you know, some of these issues or the way that we do things. So it's it's complex, you know, and that's why you know, we're in a really interesting time in the industry anyway, uh, with all these vendors coming to the market and, you know, the sort of DCT movement and, and what have you. So it's even more chaotic, uh, you know, in what feels like sort of a, a wild west of, of technology and new solutions. So, yeah, I don't necessarily see it getting better immediately, at least not the short term. Uh, and in fact, I, think, I kind of feel like it might get worse in the short term. Yeah, the mo- more tech vendors entering the space is a good thing. Like I, I will, I will always agree with the idea of competition is good. Where we talked about this a little bit on the LinkedIn Live, where that breaks down in my mind is when the buyer and the user of the software are not the same. Because the buyer of the software, the pharma, is going to choose something that a site is going to use and a patient is going to use, and is not actually seeing it firsthand, knowing it's what works and what is not working. And knowing how that compares to alternative options. The other thing that's tough is you have the procurement cycle because of the risk involved. You can't just easily swap one vendor for another. So when you make a commitment and you bring someone in as a preferred vendor, that's a, at least a one year, if not multi-year commitment to say, this is, this is the horse we picked. So as a result, you kind of have this very, you're probably not going to give it to the newcomer. You're going to give it to the incumbents is like the default state there. Incumbent software might be garbage and be, be horrible for sites and horrible for patients, but it's it's kind of like, well, that's like more of a known thing than something that's new. So it's it's hard to break in and stay in and even if you have the best product. Like that that's I think the one thing that's always weird. It's like the best product should win if the market right. is working well, but there's the disconnect between user and buyer, and then there's the slow sales cycle process which means that really best products might not actually be the ones that are being used by everybody today. And I think what gets really hard is, you know, you go to the DFARM conference I mentioned recently, there's Scope Conference, Magic. there's all these conferences that have all the vendors and their booths and their, the, you know, great, great salesmanship there, great sales teams there selling to the buyer, the pharma, yet the, the you know, the, the true voice of the patient and the true voice of the site is very rarely present or, and incorporated into that buying process. And if it is, it's more 
re-massaged by the, the vendor a little bit to make it feel it's like, you know, to hit, hit all the key points. But it's not really the, you know, that coordinator lost three hours of their day yesterday on tech support and no one ever helped them. And it, it that issue existed across all of your sites on that study. And as a result, it cost time. And because it cost time, that coordinator was slow to get to the patient because the patient sat, to your point, in the waiting room for 45 minutes. They dropped out of the study. And, and it's like this hidden cost that I don't think everyone really appreciates. Yeah. Yeah. And I, was, I had this conversation earlier today with, with someone else. The concept of having like a, <laughs> some sort of validation process for like sites and patients for all these vendors, right? Like maybe there's like a site approval stamp on some of these like vendor technologies or vendor solutions, because as it stands, there's not even really a good way for a site to know if a solution sucks or is great. Right. right? I mean, if you used it before, that's fine. But why wouldn't sponsors want that input from the site to know like, yes, uh, this particular ePro vendor is great. This one is terrible. Don't use them. It, yeah. it will make your study less successful. And with the input of sites and patients or sites that deal with the patients or whatever combination of those two things, maybe, you know, we could put together something that says like, here's what sites like to use. And here's what patients like to use. We know these are the better solutions on the market. So use them. Right. I, so the, the goal there makes so much sense. An informed pharma buyer is going to help everybody, but how you inform them gets tricky because if you're a site, you're trying to win more studies. So if you're the squeaky wheel and you're like, this DCT is unusable, if that's the pharma's preferred DCT, like you won't get picked next time. And so you're, you're I think, a little bit uh, less, not as motivated, I think, to share that, that critical information. And also, usually the person that the pharma is talking to at the site is not ultimately the, the coordinator or the user. So it's, it's a game of telephone as well. And it's, you know, yeah, we used that three months ago and the study kind of ended. So it's not top of mind for me right now. Like it's so I'm not going to bring it up on this call. So that all leads to like really not truly informed buying decisions. And then to your point also, if this is a site and they've never used the DCT before and they use it and they're like, oh, I, you know, I didn't like DCT to begin with or like, I, I don't love it. But relative to other DCTs out there, it actually would have been like the best it's hard for a pharma to parse out that context to say, yeah, this person's really, you know, squeaky wheel. They're really like loud and vocal about this being problematic, but like, I have to use DCT on this study. What were the alternatives? Does that person have experience? And is it a holistic set of feedback that factor that in? Or is it just someone that's disgruntled that doesn't, does, doesn't like this tool that, that actually is a good tool? Sure. Yeah. And that's fair. I mean, I think you could probably find some standards by which, you know, to, to do something like that. Again, we, we've worked with seven ePro vendors in the last, you know, four months. So we've got at least some breadth of experience trying different ones, but to your point, it could be trickier with newer vendor solutions out there or, uh, you know, sites with not as much experience, but we give you again, open <laughs> crowdsource, open source, be very transparent and, and broad with it. I feel like you could at least potentially make some noise because if enough sites stand up and say, Hey man, this vendor's terrible. I mean, you would have to think somebody's got to pay attention to that at some point. So as you know, software developer, we've worked on a lot of products. Like technology can be good, can be bad. And then there's there's the ability to make it better and fix the bugs and fix the issues. And so sure. it also like isn't like this, we give everybody a one-time rating and then one DCT gets an A plus and one DCT gets an F sort of thing. Like it's more of like a longitude, like every release can get better or worse and sort of thing. So it, it, in my mind, it's, it's less snapshot, more, how do you think about it just over time? And if there's a vendor that's leaning in and a site reports an issue, they don't wait on tech support for an hour and a half. They get a person right away. They know it's logged. The bug gets fixed in the next release a week later and all the people that's like submitted the issue get notified that it's closed out and the pharma gets CC to say, Hey, look at this great job we did. We, you know, sites reported something. We were responsive. Like if I'm, if I'm a pharma buyer, like that is almost better to see than the, yeah, there's an issue. And, and, you know, that's sorry, we're not, we're not fixing that issue. Yeah. So maybe just a more transparent process throughout. I mean, I've never seen that <laughs> happen ever. I've never seen, and I've heard, you know, Look, a lot of the way, and I've had this issue lately, is like, look, I can't track down every project manager to complain about everything that I'm like, hey, what's, why is this this way? Or why isn't this fixed? Or what's going on here? So we deal with our CRA a lot directly. And we'll 
CRA will give us insight. Oh yeah, there's every site's complaining about this. But more often than not, that's the end of the conversation. Right. I don't even know. Does does it get escalated? Does anyone actually care? Or you're just collecting complaints and keeping them to yourself? Like it it's never clear how that's that's happening. I've never seen it. I've never been a month later, they turn around and say, Oh, the sponsor fixed this problem that everyone was complaining about. Everyone got notified about it. Uh, it was all this was all very transparent and clear and concise and and fixed. I don't know that I've ever seen that in my 15 years at the site level. Yeah. And and then at a certain point, you know, you're shouting into the void and no one's listening and, and shouting back. And so you just give up and you just accept it. Yes. Um, yeah, that's it. I guess the fix there would be visibility. So, right. Like if, if only the tech vendor knows there's the issue, there's less motivation to, cause you're not the buyer. Like it's, it's long, as long as the buyer's right. happy, then we're good. We're not, you know, escalating up the chain of command. And then also if you're the sponsor and you just kind of out of context, hear someone at a conference, just complain about something like that's not very actionable. But if you really did know on both ends, there is an issue with this tool on this study, it is costing X amount of time across the board. And it was pre-negotiated by the sites that any of that lost time got billed at some high rate to just say you know, you te- technology issue uh, time loss is like the, the line item there. And you're just, you're just billing for the fact that you can't now use the tool. You're, you're, you're sitting on tech support. You're recouping that lost time. And now it's hitting the sponsor's bottom line. They know that the issue is, you know, they're acutely aware of the issue. The vendor knows they're acutely aware of the issue. The vendor knows that their, you know, re-upping of the contract is coming up in three months. There's now like, I think a much more interesting conversation for the vendor and sponsor to, to hold that, hold each other accountable there. But like today, there's no way for the site voice to, to get there. It's all just one-off conversations to the CRA where that's probably to your point, that's probably where the conversation dies because they don't have a great way to elevate that and run that up the flagpole. Yeah. And what are they going to complain to their boss? And they're going to look like they're, they're being a complaining or whatever. Yeah. I mean, again, I see how, I see how the system is set up in a way that doesn't really incentivize those fixes to happen in a lot and in, yeah. in a lot of instances. So, well, fair enough. I, I do want to encourage everyone and I'll post this in the show notes to check out the, uh, the LinkedIn live we did. Cause, uh, you know, Mike was able to demo versus trial, which I think is adds another nice element here to be able to actually see how it works because it's a uh, super clean, very easy to use. Which again, I appreciate not having to operate like a whole new platform per se, as opposed to just open Chrome and it shows up there on my my homepage. Anything else as we kind of wrap up here? Um, for any, well, I guess this this will probably get uh, released after Site Solution Summit. But for anyone that's going to be uh, in Florida next week uh, at the Site Solution Summit, would love to meet you in person. Uh, we're booth number one twenty. Uh, otherwise, you can check me out on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just Mike Wanger, and it's a versatrial.io is our website. Beautiful. Make sure that it hits the show notes. And uh, Mike, appreciate you coming on. I hope that uh, you'll come back when you uh, more updates of Versatrial, and uh, we'll uh, we'll do another live and. Keep demoing it as you uh, build it out, man. It's, it's exciting stuff. Amazing. Thanks for having me, Brad. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. As always, thank you so much for listening to Note to File Podcast. Uh, make sure to check us out at notetofilepodcast.com for uh, episode transcripts, guest contact information, and show notes. Thanks again. <laughs>